This is my twelfth video on my attempts to construct a small OO gauge layout. See part one for my reasons for doing this, and my lengthy series on my N gauge railway modelling for more interesting stuff with trains running, etc. This part is another build video from a Metcalf card building kit. This time another fairly complex one, the stone built corner shop in OO gauge PO264. I had built the Metcalf corner shop before in N gauge from an old Metcalf kit, but this OO gauge version, though following the same basic structure, was a much more complex build with quite a number of additional features not present in the N gauge version I did. I went with the stone built version. You can also get basically the same building but brick built if that suits your layout requirements better as PO263. The kit comes in the standard Metcalf flat pack. As a minor quibble, I wish they'd provide some simple way for opening these. They used to, actually. The older kits had a perforated line on the back of the pack where you could tear to open the pack. The best way I've found to open the current packaging is to carefully use a sharp knife to slit along the top, but obviously that risks either cutting your fingers or damaging the contents if you're not careful and precise enough. Once you get the contents out of the pack, this is what you have. Two folded sheets of instructions, quite a complex build, a folded sheet of heavy card supports and strengtheners, a fairly large sheet of acetate glazing parts, two folded sheets of printed card parts, a sheet of heavy paper with various detailed items printed but not pre-cut, one laser cut sheet for sills and lintels, two sheets of Metcalf's self-adhesive paving stones, and a standard sheet of ridge tiles in two colours. I found the instructions for this kit a bit confusing, as they don't flow from page to page on the instruction sheets. Rather, when you open the sheets out, the instructions follow across the top of the left-hand page, onto the top of the right-hand page, then back below on the left-hand page, again across to the right-hand page, etc. That is to say, the two-page fold-out is treated as a single page, with the instructions flowing right across in rows from left to right, more or less. This means you can't really fold the sheet back, but have to keep the whole double sheet open to properly read the instructions. The instructions are numbered, but I still managed to get a bit confused as to the order in which I was being asked to do things. I get the impression that the latest Metcalf kits have switched to instructions in the form of a stapled booklet, which I find clearer and easier to work with in a limited workspace. <laughs> Most unusually for a Metcalf kit, there were some flaws in the printing of my kit in this case. See the white blotches in the black area in this picture. Fortunately, the only really noticeable examples of this were in places that would ultimately be hidden by other parts, so there was no impact on the finished model. Though I wasn't sure of this at the start, so I did try to correct the flaws. Since there are no printed identifiers on the heavy card sheet, I penciled in the names of the parts based on the key in the instructions as seen here. This is the printed card part for the main walls. As is usual with Metcalf kits, the printed card parts are pre-cut and there are clear indications as to where you need to make finishing cuts to free the parts. It can still be a bit fiddly, but generally with care you end up with nice clear edges to the parts. I do find it advisable to use a knife around the window inserts as seen here before trying to push them out, as you don't want to leave bits of ragged card around the edges of the window frames. Here, all of the window inserts for the main walls have been taken out. The tabs are all pre-scored. Here I found the parts for the relevant doors. I wasn't entirely clear which door was supposed to go where. I mean, one's labelled house door and the other's labelled shop door, but it isn't clear which, which is which on the wall. Um, I suppose it wouldn't really matter a lot if you interchanged them. Here I've cut out all of the glazing parts for the main walls. I cut out the glazing parts using scissors, as I find the acetate doesn't cut readily with a knife, and knife cutting is more prone to causing distortions than using scissors on the acetate. However, in this case a couple of acetate parts were provided for open windows. 
and for those I had no choice but to cut out the openings with a sharp knife. Hard to do really well, and as you can see here, I didn't manage to do it perfectly. The door tabs are folded back and glued before attaching the doors. The glazing parts for the main shop windows need to be attached before folding back the yellow tabs, as the glazing is supposed to be sandwiched between the tabs and the wall. Then all of the yellow tabs are folded back and glued. Next I attach the two open windows, as I figured I might as well go with this novelty. This is the first time I've seen this in a Metcalf kit. Then I attach the doors, one of which has its own glazing parts, which were attached first. And then the remainder of the glazing parts were glued on behind their respective window openings. There are two pieces left over because the open windows have replaced two of the regular windows. This kit provides laser-cut window sills and lintels. These are optional, as the printed wall does include printed sills and lintels, but obviously the laser-cut parts will provide a better effect, being actually 3D, so I went ahead and used them, gluing them over the printed sills and lintels. One note, if you're going to use the bay window, which is another optional feature, you shouldn't glue on the laser-cut sill and lintel for the window over which the bay windows will go. This isn't really made clear in the instructions. I glued on all of the laser-cut sills and lintels, so I ended up not bothering with the bay window. Next, the issue of curtains needs to be addressed. Metcalf always say to glue pieces of scrap card behind the windows and then glue the curtains to the scrap card in order to space the curtains back from the windows. I never bothered with this in N-Gage, as in that small scale I found the curtains look perfectly fine just glued behind the glazing. But in the larger scale of OO-Gage I figured maybe it was worth doing it the way Metcalf suggested. So as well as cutting out the curtains themselves, which are provided as paper parts, I also cut a bunch of small strips of card. Then I carefully glued strips of card to either side of each window which was to have curtains. So each window now has these mounting strips for the curtains themselves. Then I glued on all of the curtains. And here is the main wall with its windows and doors finished. Quite a time-consuming process just to get this far. Next I address the window displays. At top here you can see the plain card supports that are made up for the window displays. Then you need to cut out your chosen displays from the paper detail sheet and glue them to the supports. As you can see, displays are provided for a baker, a butcher, a grocer and a newsagent. I was aiming at a sort of village store that basically sells pretty much everything, so I went with one of the grocer displays and one of the newsagent displays. Next, the main walls are folded around a heavy card inner former. There's a gap at the back where the other part of the building will attach. Then heavy card strengtheners are glued to the end walls above the inner floor, first at one end, then at the other, this one with a gap for the window and an extension to serve as a tab for the additional part of the building. Then the upper heavy card floor mat is glued on over those parts. All these heavy card parts make for a sturdy, rigid building. This was where I realised I was getting confused with the order of the instructions, no harm done really, but I had folded the instruction sheet and gone straight on from the curtains to the window displays, skipping the instructions to make up the base. So now I return to those. The pink tabs set into the inner base fold over and glue back and then those folded tabs fit into recesses in the main base, providing a definite setting for the relative position of the inner base on the main base. So here is the top with the building inner base fixed to the main outer base. Then the shop floor, the red part, fits on top of the inner base in the corner which will actually be the shop interior. Next pieces for the shop interior walls fit behind the shop floor. Again, some choices are provided, including a chip shop, but I went with what best seemed to represent a general store. Then your window displays can be glued in place. There's also a part on the paper detail sheet for a store counter, but I didn't notice this until I'd closed up the shop so it didn't get fitted in my case. Not a massive loss, as it would be pretty difficult to ever see it, really. 
Now a former needs to be made for the chimney that's attached to the building by gluing together a stack of heavy card pieces. The chimney at the end of the building is then folded round this former, which sits on the upper floor. And here is the outer main structure at this stage. Now the shop door is glued in its slanted position on the corner. This is not quite as tricky as it looks, as the door part rests on the inner folded tabs which hold it quite neatly. Now we've got a base and a main building, but they're still separate. Now the other part of the building is made up, starting again with its main walls. Again the tabs are folded over and glued, and the glazing parts are glued behind the windows but the tabs for the openings for the passageway are not glued. They're folded but not glued. Heavy card formers are glued to the base of the centre wall. These will form part of the passageway, the entry as it's called in my part of the world. Now the printed inner wall for the entry is glued onto the heavy card formers. And then the walls fold up round the multi-thickness entry wall. And then the printed part for the opposite wall of the entry is glued to the tabs. Now I should probably have done the curtains earlier than this, but at least I remembered to do them at this point. Again I glued strips of card beside the windows, and then glued the curtains behind the cards for each of the windows. You can also see here how the entry works. You can see the entry to the passageway there. Now a heavy card floor glues over the top of the entry, reinforcing the form of the whole building section. There are laser cut sills and lintels for the windows of this section as well, and also lintels for the entry itself. So I glued all of these in place. These are the framing pieces for the main shop windows. All of their edges need to be blackened before fitting them. The frames fit round the bottom and sides of the store windows. Then a slightly complex arrangement of spacers needs to be glued on to support the main store sign, which will go round the corner, protruding at an angle. I should really have blackened the edges of these before sticking them on. The kit provides a few printed card parts for the main signs, and then several more signs are provided on the paper detail sheets. I didn't like any of the card options as they didn't suit the kind of shop I wanted to model, but there was a paper option that fitted my intentions pretty well. So I cut out the paper option, and then I glued it over the card option that most closely matched in colour, as I thought that a paper part alone would be too flimsy and then I glued my made-up sign in place to the supports. This all went together fairly well, other than my failure to blacken the edges of the upper parts, but I can do that later. Sills were then glued on under the main windows, and I did remember to pre-blacken those. Finally, small pieces are glued on to each end of the sign to finish those ends properly and hide the ends of the sign and support parts. Now we're getting to the point of attaching the building parts to the base. This gave me some trouble. The main building has to glue on round the corner of the inner base so that the shop interior fits in correctly behind the shop windows. Then the second part of the building is supposed to fit on behind with its wall overlapping the edge of the base and fitting into a recess. But I found that if I butted this part up against the main building, it wouldn't really reach the back of the card. I resorted to cutting out the recess in the back of the card to make it bigger, in order to get the parts to go together somewhat satisfactorily. Even with the recess cut out somewhat to allow the extension to sit further forward, the join in the walls between the two building sections still wasn't very good. But this was the best I could do with it. Uh, I'm talking about the join in the middle of this picture where the front section of the building joins the back building. I just couldn't get that to go neatly together. Here's the back view showing the inside of the entry and the yard. The fit on this side isn't too bad. So here's the building as a whole from the front at this point. 
Note that an interior support for the roof has been glued into the extension section, now the yellow peak at the left. Now the roofs are glued on, and the second chimney stack goes in, made up like the first, with a block of heavy card formers and then a printed part folded round. Despite my problems fitting the building sections together onto the base, the roofs went on quite neatly. And here's the view from the front, now with the roofs in place. The poor join in the walls is a bit annoying, but it isn't too obvious. The building isn't looking too bad, though various edges still need to be coloured at this point. Now the back walls of the yard go on. A gate is folded double and glued, and then sandwiched between the inner and outer yard walls. The outhouse wall gets a door and window glazing, and then is glued into the corner of the yard. Again, I had some problems with the fit. If I glued the walls round the edge of the base, they didn't quite reach the building wall. You can see here there's a gap between the yard wall and the building wall. A flat roof goes onto the outhouse. I cut a thin piece of printed stone to close the gap where the walls didn't meet. I was able to do this where printing on the card sheet overlapped the parts. Here you can see how the gap showed quite badly from this angle. So I glued my thin strip of stonework into the gap. Not perfect, but at least there isn't an obvious gap now. The dormer windows are a final item for the building. They are optional. The roof looks perfectly fine and complete without them, but they do definitely add something, so I decided to use them. Each of the three dormer windows gets its own glazing part and inner former. The glazing parts glue into the back of the dormer frames, fitting over the entire middle section. Then the frames fold back around the rectangular formers. I did my best at this point to blacken the edges where the white card shows. I wasn't uh, really clear where to fit the dormer windows, as the instructions don't make it clear. I referred to the colour picture on the packaging for guidance. Based on that colour picture, I glued the dormer windows onto the roofs, two on the main building and one on the extension. Then each dormer window gets its own roof, joined as neatly as possible to the main roof. Capstones go onto the yard walls. The kit comes with two sheets of Metcalf self-adhesive paving stones, and these can be used for paving the walk around the building. However, printed paving parts are also provided, and I elected to use these, setting the self-adhesive paving aside, perhaps for future use. Once the paving is in place, hiding the last visible portion of the base, door steps are glued in front of each of the doors. Here's a picture without flash, giving a more natural view of the building's colouring. And here's a close-up of the store itself, showing the windows display. You can see perhaps what I meant earlier about it not really being at all easier to see that the counterpart isn't fitted. The other window display and the entry passage. There are still a few details to do. Ridge tile strips are cut to length for the roof sections. I went with the grey tiles, but red tiles are also provided. The ridge tiles need to have their edges and folds coloured in, and this is best done before fitting them. Now ridge tiles have been fitted to all of the roof sections, including the dormer windows. Now for my least favourite part, the chimney pots. Printed strips of paper are provided, terracotta on one side and black on the other. These come from the instruction sheet and so are on fairly thin paper. They need to be rolled as neatly as you can manage into chimney pots. I use a barbecue skewer to roll the OO gauge pots. You need to try to roll them as tightly and neatly as possible. It isn't that easy to get them to roll evenly. And then you've got to manage to glue them closed without making too much mess. I find that quite a bit of glue has to be used to get this to work. It's no use worrying about getting some glue on the outside. They just won't hold together if you don't put enough glue. This kit requires six chimney pots, as there are two large chimneys. Metcalf generally provides you with a few extra paper strips in case you mess some up, which is quite likely. Once made up, the tops of the pots need to be blackened to hide the white paper, 
and you do your best to hide the paper at the end of the rolling. I always make up the chimney capstones and attach the pots on the bench before gluing them onto the chimneys. Quite a bit of glue is required again to get the pots to stay sensibly on the capstones. The glue will dry clear so it won't ultimately be as visible as it is here. And finally the capstones and pots can be glued onto the chimneys. And here is the shop on the layout. It's definitely going on this corner as that's really the only place for it. Obviously the ground around it needs to be finished better to make it fit in more sensibly. I may use the paving stones that came with this kit to make a bit of a walk along the road. Here's a view looking over the Metcalf church which I built previously. Various things are still not really finished. However, the basics of the village area are starting to come into shape. Still several more kit builds to come, and the ground needs a lot more work.